Well, here we are, just about. Thank you, thank you. So I was just joking that uh, the, after this talk, uh, maybe the computer scientists will be able to tell me what, what, it, what it was about. And uh <laughs> anyway, I will, I'm going to state a, a problem on universality. Um, yeah, Katrin reminded me at some point that this is a workshop on homogeneity, but it is a trimester on universality. And uh, I thought I would say something about universality uh, without homogeneity. But as a model theorist, that's a somewhat strange thing to talk about. Um, and my first reaction when Kamiat raised this question of universality without homogeneity was that it was the wrong question. And uh, well, we'll see about that. But uh, in any case, the problem I'm going to consider has the following main ingredient, a, uh, a finite connected graph C, which controls the action. And then the uh, set of countable C-free graphs. These are countable graphs that don't contain C as a subgraph. I repeat, as a subgraph. <laughs> and for the model theorists, I say once more, not an induced subgraph. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, the, these are the rules of the game. And uh, we ask whether there's a countable universal C-free graph. So this is, uh, among other things, a question about universality. In the countable context, which is a very strong restriction. And it's in, I th to my way of thinking, it's something like the simplest question I could ask. And specifically, since C is finite, this is a question about C. And what I'd like to understand is this property that there is or is not a, a uh, universal countable C-free graph says something about C. What does it say about C? Uh, is this structurally intelligible? <coughs> there are a few questions, really. So let's, uh, let's play with that for a second. The first question is the one I've asked. The second question, I will argue, is the one I should have asked, which is not immediately evident. And what I mean is, even if I'm a graph theorist who happens to have a passion for the first question, I would still claim that the second one is the one that I should ask. Um, the third question is, if there is a countable universal secret graph with an oligomorphic automorphism group, then what is the language for making this graph become a homogeneous structure? I mean, it's not going to become a homogeneous graph but a homogeneous something, you know, metric space, whatever it may be. Uh, and then what is the associated structural Ramsey th theory, which is not my topic today, not my topic really ever, but it's an interesting topic. Um, and a small remark here that we do know at least one thing. We know that if the answer to the second question is positive, then this, the, reason, the universal object can be viewed as a homogeneous structure in a finite relational language. So it falls into that area, which is one of a family of, in, of sort of connected strange facts because I'm sort of saying that all of zero categoricity is no more general than homogeneity, which is, you know, just false. <laughs> <laughs> but in this context, it's, the, it's true. So this is somehow a very limited context where things are true, which is nice. This slide is an outlier in the talk. Uh, this is the model theory slide. And this is not really going to be a model theory talk. So I'll, I'll come back to what I'm actually talking about afterwards. But 
I thought I should admit to what I actually see as the problem. So let me digress off to here. So, so really, C should not be a, a single finite connected graph, but it should be a finite set of finite structures in a finite relational language. It should be a finite set of constraints. Okay. And then you should consider the theory of C-free structures. And then you should consider, and I'm not going to develop this theme today, so some of this may not make sense to a lot of people, but I'll just go briefly over it. You take the theory of existentially closed C-free graphs. You look at that. And I think the real question that emerges for me from this is that there's a very sort of large question here. Can you compute the model theoretic properties of this theory from the finite set of data? And this is very similar to asking the same question for simply models of a universal sentence. But if I ask that question, then I expect all interesting problems to be undecidable. And if I ask this question, I semi-expect, I kind of consider the, the intriguing possibility that all of these problems are decidable. And that's where the difference between induced substructures and substructures, it seems to sort of cross the boundary from hopelessly complicated to maybe we can completely understand it. Um, I'm mainly focused here on whether this theory is all of zero categorical, which is the same as my second question. You could also ask whether this is what we call a small theory, which is the same as my first question. And then you could ask for all the other notions, which we know are natural. I got into this from the graph theory side with one particular question that translates into one particular property, and I haven't really looked past that. But what I've experienced suggests that you could play this game in a lot of different ways, and that I haven't necessarily picked you know, the most important property here to, to study. So anyway, I return to my actual topic. <laughs> uh, so we're trying to understand what, what we're saying about this constraint graph C by asserting the existence of a universal object. And some elementary graph terminology is relevant here. It turns out the block structure is very important in these graphs. So what are these, what are these blocks? These are maximal two-connected pieces. I'll have a picture in a second, maybe less than a second. OK, there's a picture. On the left is a graph with three blocks. And they all come together at a single cut vertex. Um, anyway, when you think about blocks, you realize that they form a tree. The tree is really the tree of the, the cut vertices. If you remove them, it disconnects. The cut vertices and the blocks make a tree where you attach you know, the cut vertices to the blocks that they belong to. And so it's not just the blocks. That's what I'm emphasizing. It's the blocks and the cut vertices. So anyway, when you look at this sort of star-like graph and you look at the tree, it's a star. Okay. And this, this structural, this is one key piece of the structural an analysis of C for the present purposes. So here's an example, one block. Suppose there are no cut vertices. So this is a, a very nice result, one of the main results in the area of Freddy Kamiat. Let, let there be just one block, then the existence of a universal or an oligomorphic universal thing is equivalent to C being complete, where we've always known, at least since Henson, that, that these things exist and are homogeneous. I mean, so, so this is an extreme case. And this is, uh, well, this is the sort of thing that I was expecting to see. In fact, I was expecting to see <laughs> something much stronger than this. And, 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 uh, hmm? There are no cut vertices. So if you take out a vertex, it stays connected. So in my previous picture, these blobs, B1, B2, and B3, are two connected. A typical example is a cycle. Uh, it wasn't immediate. It, um, 90s, I guess. but. Uh, you know, I started looking at this in 89-90, and this came along later. Um, yeah, maybe 97. Uh, hmm? You were, you were the ah, 
Not at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's really what bothered me about this whole question the first time I heard it. Um, what is a universal graph? So take the case of no constraints. What is a universal graph? Well, it contains the, the Rado graph. It's a graph that, the Rado graph and then something more. <laughs> so, uh, now model theory slide, if it made any sense, it actually explains how to make it canonical. I mean, I'm talking about things ultimately being all of zero categorical, at which point they'd better be canonical. So if you, I don't want to do this today, but if you're willing to think about existentially closed structures, then, then my question is whether it's unique in some sense. I mean, it's, uh, but the universal thing in any case will become unique under my <coughs> constraints. So there's, there's a way of making this canonical, yes, but it isn't a canonical according to the definitions. Um, but making it canonical allows you to develop a theory. Hmm? Oh, it's a clique, a complete graph. Yeah. So this is a classic case. If you have a complete graph and you, you, know, you consider, so Kn, complete graph of order n, you consider Kn free graphs, you get your homogeneous universal object, and there isn't anything else. And though this theorem wasn't actually known when I first started thinking about the subject, it was, it was kind of a model anyway for what we were expecting, <laughs> except something much stronger. <laughs> hmm? Universal. I don't say universal homogeneous, so that was the question. Huh? Okay, anyway. Going on, um, the first thing that... that really surprised me was Kamyat's example, which is part of this slide. So Kamyat went and looked at the simplest case of two blocks, which is two triangles attached at a point. Well, it's not the simplest case, but just about. <laughs> <laughs> and he found that there is a universal graph. And I remember that, I, I, mean, I, I don't remember why anymore, but I remember I was strongly not expecting that. <laughs> And so I got very interested and sort of plowed through the whole thing um, and worked out the two block case completely. And I mean, I was kind of guessing that it was important here that the number three is a small number. And what are the small numbers? Well, I think the largest small number is four. <laughs> so again, I was wrong. I mean, it turns out five is a small number. <laughs> and that's what this slide says. Except it isn't just small, it's uh, this third clause here says, well, if you want to have a universal graph you should, and you have two blocks, then they should be complete and one of them should be small, but if the other one is small but, but actually large at the same time, namely equal to five, then the other one actually needs to be big, which makes no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've discussed with Shala whether this makes sense. <laughs> we actually don't seem to entirely agree about that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> this slide is supposed to say something about why specifically two block. Maybe I should have a, a little bit of a little bit of chalk here. Uh, so this is going to be a very simple picture. And if I can make it visible. <coughs> I've written sort of K5 wedge K5. That's this thing here. Two cliques of order five wedged together. Okay. Sorry? One is big and one is small. No, no, that oh. <laughs> <laughs> the chalk and, and the chalk was wet to boot. But anyway. These better be the same size fives in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've used numbers as variables in the past, but, <laughs> but not here. Um, so anyway, what is this picture? You have these cliques of order five that you can see kind of lined up in a, I don't know, like a film strip or something. And I've singled out for your attention the middle 
row of edges, and I've written the word rigid over it. Um, this is, in the context of, uh, this is first of all a K5 wedge K5 free graph. That's one of the most important things about it. The second most important thing is it's only just barely. It's, it's only just barely K5 wedge K5 free. If you try to attach one more five clique anywhere in this picture, you're going to get a K5 wedge K5. So this is kind of a maximal, in a certain sense, K5 wedge K5 free graph. And it's become very rigid in, in the sense that if you look at this graph and if it's embedded into, if it's embedded into a larger graph of the same kind, embedded into a K5 wedge K5 free graph, then you can completely reconstruct from just a couple of points the entire picture. I mean, there won't be any more five clicks anywhere around this. And from any, actually from any single point, you can reconstruct a kind of a, a kind of a connected component in a certain strong sense that will look exactly like this. So this is a very rigid picture. One point determines the whole picture, and two points, two adjacent points in the middle line is a little bit better for my purposes because it not only determines the whole picture, but it determines the whole picture with an orientation, which is what these arrows stand for. In other words, if I were to fix the first two points in that middle line, then after embedding this into any graph in my collection, I would still be able to see that blue line coming out as a definable set of functions. And so this is an extremely rigid thing. This definitely violates any possibility of having an olive zero categorical automorphism group anywhere in the picture. Because from, from two, well, from two points I can define infinitely many points. And if you think about it, it also violates the possibility of having a universal object at all. There's a this is sort of why these two things are so closely related. Usually the picture that violates all its very categoricity with some decorations, some Christmas tree ornamentations becomes a picture that, that violates universality. And I didn't really want to spend a lot of time on that, so I don't have any more slides on this. But if you want to, I'll say a word or two about it, which one could, it's a very simple argument. It's the same argument at the end of every proof. You take a picture like this, then you take some widely dispersed vertices, like distance six from each other or something, and you add some ad additional decorations in uncountably many ways, and then this, then you realize that this can't all fit into one countable graph. So that's so this is little modifications which you can almost always make, but not not always. So really, the two questions I started with are very similar, and this is sort of the. Typical proof of non-existence sitting here, something like this. And this is part of what one needs to understand, what, what is actually taking place here. So um, here's a, another, I'm giving sample theorems, and we'll slide off eventually into conjectures. I hope you can tell when that happens. But anyway, <laughs> to begin with, uh, so for the case of trees, if you're looking for an oligomorphic automorphism group, then you need to be looking at the constraint graph being a path. Um, the constraint graph being a path was one of the earliest examples considered. This is Kamyat, Meckler, Pock, and this is what had just been done when Kamyat started explaining the subject to me. And if you want to uh, take out the oligomorphic condition, then you have to change the constraint a little bit. It now what, what I would call a near path, you get to add one more leaf. So, and that's it. So you get to take a path and add just one more leaf to it. So I don't like this as much as the previous one. But anyway, that's the answer. Uh, so, so we sort of, uh, you know, so we're sort of in mode of looking at examples and, and assuming that these are not random examples that maybe they're trying to tell us something. So here are some reasonable conclusions from the story so far. And well, so for any comment, it seems like the block should be complete. It's not what the theorem says, but it seems like what the theorem means. Um, Maybe the block, if, if blocks are so important and paths are so important, maybe the block structure should be path-like. This is free fantasy mode for a while, you know. <laughs> uh, 
doesn't seem to be much difference between the two formulations of the problem. And kind of looks like the oligomorphic case when they do differ is the cleaner of the two. These are obviously prejudiced conclusions, <laughs> but uh, probably shared prejudices today. OK, so anyway, let's, let's make some actual conjectures in this vein. So some of this is conjectural. Uh, so the solidity conjecture is still a conjecture now. So we've definitely slid into the conjecture territory at this point. Uh, we do, you know, OK, so we conjecture that the block should be complete. And the path, like, uh, this is a little bit more adventurous, but basically after removal of some, a few whiskers, these are sort of attached paths, then it seems reasonable to me to say that then the, after you remove some whiskers, the tree of blocks should actually become a path. So here's a, here's a path of blocks and some barely visible whiskers. So it should look something like this. So, okay, uh, here's a fairly recent theorem. Uh, it says basically that the second conjecture is stronger than the first. Um, namely, that when you're down to what I call a block path, for me, a block path is a graph whose, whose blocks form a path. Okay. Uh, so if you're down to the block path case, then the blocks are complete. That's the theorem. And I, I intend to talk about that. Okay, so there are two kinds of methods in this area. There are what I call exclusion methods and the positive methods, namely, you have ways of proving that there is no universal object. These are fairly systematic. Uh, I've given you one example so far. And you have ways of proving that there is a universal graph, which I think is, seems to be a harder problem, actually. Um, so I'm going to talk, first of all, about these exclusion methods, because that's uh, for example, what the main point of Ferretti Kamiat is to exclude everything except the complete case, and this block, and we're trying to generalize that to the block path case. So uh, we really, we actually only use three methods. Um, for a while, I thought we were only going to use one. Namely, this there's a certain sense in which this rigidity argument is the only argument we have. Uh, I mean, we ultimately, it's at some level, if you want to prove the non-existence of a universal structure, you're trying to prove some rigidity statement about finitely many points determining infinitely many points. And the Ferretti Kamiat, I'm looking at the third item on the list here. The Ferretti Kamiat paper uses a very particular rigidity construction, which I have not shown you in my previous picture which I call the hypergraph template, they, they take, a, they take a, a hypergraph of a fairly large size, large enough to fit copies of the constraint graph in it and things like that. And then they take a very large girth hypergraph, which has its own sort of rigidity properties. And then they plaster approximations to the forbidden subgraph everywhere they can all over the hypergraph. So this is if you've been smoking something, this may be agreeable to hear. But <laughs> <laughs> in any case, all right, I'm getting carried away. I, I didn't intend to say anything about it. So anyway, it, it, they have this nice technique. But there are a couple of other sort of inductive techniques, which we call pruning, that in many cases are far superior to honest work. So I'll say something about this, mainly corner pruning. pruning. So in the case of trees, the notion of pruning is extremely natural. You prune the leaves. So here's a tree in all of its glory, and here it is pruned. And that's pruning. 
And, you know, it's a kind of a reduction, truncation operation, but all leaves at once, not one leaf at a time, that's all. So, so this, is, this is pruning for the case of trees. And then the lemma is that if you had a big complicated tree and it was nice, there was a countable universal tree-free graph, then after you prune it, it's still nice. So this is an inductive principle. And, and it's hard to find true inductive principles. They're very valuable. So this is a true inductive principle. Uh, because if you had the universal object for the first kind and you took the points of infinite degree in it, then you'd have the universal object for the second kind. So it's not too hard to prove. <laughs> And this is the main thing you need to prove the theorem about trees, which I mentioned before, to get the classification of the trees with the universal graph. Um, if you believe, for example, well, in the general case, if you believe that the general criterion for having a universal object is this near path criterion, then in order to prove that, what you need to do is to look at trees which have the property that when pruned, they become a near path, in other words, a path or a near path, and then prove something about them. So, you know, it will look something like that. The T at the top is the kind of T that I actually have to worry about, and the T at the bottom, you know, it prunes to a near path. So, it's not, you know, your friendliest, you actually have to prove that this thing doesn't have a you know, that there's no universal T-free graph, you have to do a rigidity construction. I mean, you do, you can't avoid all honest work, but you kind of know something about the tree, so you can actually say what you need to do. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying here? So this pruning idea tells us that if we think that the final answer to our question is very simple, then in order to prove it, we have to consider the, the next most complicated case and then just do something about that in the traditional way. Near, near, near paths. The near paths. Yeah. And if you want it oligomorphic, then the paths. Th this lemma is the proof of that statement. <laughs> this lemma, together with some, some longish constructions of 14 different cases, is the proof of that statement. Yeah. This, this lemma tells you what you need to prove in order to prove the theorem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't. Um, so this is pruning. Sort of. Well, I called it 1A, actually. It's pruning 1A, or 1.0, I suppose. Um, any questions at this point? This is sort of a, I've closed kind of one sm small circle here. All right. So the general notion of pruning is you need to think about really segments of your graph, which are, well, yeah, I said it, connected unions of blocks. That would be a segment, but, but not really segments. This is Siren's word, corners. Uh, these are segments that go, they're like branches of trees. They're segments that start at a cut vertex. And basically, you could do the following. Take a cut vertex, remove it, take one connected component of what's left, put the cut vertex back in. That's a segment. Essentially, you're looking at the tree of blocks, and you're taking an arbitrary vertex as root, and then you're taking a branch and looking at what piece of the graph corresponds to that. So. What I'm trying to say here in this lemma that I wasn't necessarily proposing you read is that you can prune corners, not just leaves. So you could prune leaves, you could prune branches, you could prune trees going out from a certain point, or you can prune the whole thing with, with blocks, with, you know, with pieces of the graph replaced. And how do you prune? Well, you don't really see this so much with a leaf. What is a leaf? It's, from my point of view, a leaf is actually two vertices and an edge. And the leaf is sitting at the end of the edge, and it's attached at, at the other end. And what I'm removing is 
I'm removing all of this I mean, you have to look hard at a leaf to see that this is what you're actually doing. Uh, so here's your leaf L. And what you're doing sort of is you're looking at this edge as based on the attached vertex, and you're removing all of the edge except for this vertex, which in this particular case is just one vertex. You're removing all of the corner except for the place where the corner is attached. Okay. So, so this is that, the actual notion of pruning that, that works in general. And that's why in this lemma, if you look at it, it, it basically it says you can prune corners. But it, it's, it, in the second sentence, it says, let V S be a corner. And V would be the, the point of attachment of the corner to the graph. And actually, I didn't say it was sort of clear when I said all leaves. How do you prune a corner? Well, you look for any other corner that embeds into the one you're pruning over the base point. All right. We can forget all that, but I just want to be honest, at least, you know, <laughs> about what the definition is. So that's the actual notion of pruning. <sighs> well. How about those trees from before? <laughs> <laughs> now replace each point by a nice round ball or something. Well, one, one of the easiest cases is you do block leaves. You prune block leaves. So you take the tree of blocks, and you essentially prune the leaves in the tree of blocks. But you don't remove you know, the point of attachment. You don't remove the cut vertex. You just remove everything but the cut vertex. So a, a typical case is you, you take external blocks that only are attached at one point, and you remove all of the ex well, you take, say, a minimal external block, and you remove all copies of a minimal external block, leaving the point of attachment. And if you don't, and there are reasons why you might want, not want to do a minimal one. If you don't do a minimal one, then you take away that one plus everything that fits inside it in the sense of fitting inside over the point of attachment. The, that's how it's done. And then the formalism turns out to have exactly all the properties of the original construction. And essentially the same proof. So this is the real form of pruning, OK. And now I'll give you an application where I guess we'll sort of see this in action a little bit. Um, so this has to do with this completeness theorem. So I'm talking now about the proof that if you have a block path and you want a universal structure, then you need to have complete blocks. So this is going to go basically by induction on the length of the path. And for length 1, it's just a block. And for any comyet, by a direct construction that we have nothing to say about, can't simplify it, for any comyet treats the case of length 1. And I, I need for any comyet to treat the case of length 2 as well before the engines really start to roll. So you have to doctor it up so that it actually handles length 2. And then you start analyzing a counterexample to my claim of minimal length. So, so let C be a block path with L blocks. And let's suppose that we're wrong. Let's suppose that there is a countable universal C free graph, but we don't have this complete, we don't have the blocks complete. And consider it minimal. So consider a minimal counterexample. Now all it says is consider minimal counterexample to what we want to prove then this is what pruning leaves you with. Leaves you with something which is not entirely clear. But this is what it leaves you with. First of all, one thing which is reasonably nice is that at least the blocks are complete other than the end blocks. By the way, I'm going to permit myself, since this is a path, I'm going to permit myself to start the numbering from either end, whatever is convenient to make everything true. <coughs> but in any case, uh, even without that, the blocks bi are certainly complete. Well, what will happen if I, if I prune at the ends? So I prune at the ends. I just remove one block at, at one end. And maybe I remove a block at another end. And maybe if I'm clumsy, I remove more than that. If I remove a very large block at one end, then I might remove a piece at the other end. But that would be clumsy. As Nixon said, that would be wrong. So 
If we remove a minimal block, take a block of minimal size at one end or the other, remove a minimal block, then we'll remove either just that block or maybe both blocks because they're isomorphic and we can't get away and we can't avoid it, which would be a little annoying, but that might happen. So there's a sort of a symmetrical case here. All of the blocks will be complete apart from the sort of the one I'm focused on, uh, B1. And maybe I'll have a problem with the other end uh, in the case when the two ends are isomorphic. But if the two ends are isomorphic and I prove that B1 is, com is complete, I'll still be done. <laughs> so, this is, so this is the simple consequence of pruning, the immediate simple consequence of pruning. L greater than or equal to 3, I'm going to attribute that to Ferretti Kamiat because that's their technique entirely. And then you get kind of into a little bit of trouble down here. Um, L2 is the corner. This is for Carol now. You want to see a corner? <laughs> take the second cut vertex V2 here and take the left side. That's L2. Including V2. Including V2. And then... Uh, and take the, take the right side starting at V1, and that's uh, R1, okay? And R1 is, all, well, most of R1 is in red, and most of L2 is in blue, except now I'm leaving out the cut vertices. So L2 minus is not quite up to V2, and R1 plus is starting beyond V1. And uh, <coughs> it turns out that you only really get into trouble. I mean, this situation only survives if this left piece starting from here and going back is embeddable into this right-hand piece starting from here and going forward. And this is what you see if you try to understand B1 by desperate measures. If you decide you want to prune from V2 to the right, you want to prune R2, if you want to prune this thing, then you're trying to do this in such a way that B1 is left behind to apply induction to. So if B1 is left behind, then induction says it's got to be complete and you're done. And if it's not left behind, then some segment, then B1 somehow got disposed of when I pruned, when I pruned on the right, the left side went away. And that turns out to give this condition, depending in part on the fact that this middle block is already known to be complete. There's a, I mean, there's two ways, basically, the left side could disappear. It could disappear because it just disappears, namely B1 over this point happens to embed in B3 over that point. Or it could disappear because actually what happened was the, these two blocks disappeared at once, that these B1, B2 sitting over that point embedded into this thing. So there are two ways this could go away, but in either case, something emerges. There's a, there's a kind of a weak symmetry condition, a very weak symmetry condition that you can see on the right something that looks like what you can see on the left. And that's why, I, now it gets more complicated, but anyway, uh, oh, I was explaining here at the bottom how to get the third line, prune the terminal segment, you know? Okay. So, oh, now you need some notion of what I'm calling symmetric local pruning, and you're not going to get a lot out of this slide, I don't think, but there's another notion of pruning that comes up at this point, and it turns out that what I just said is... This third condition is what I need to have it become relevant. And uh, there's a more general form of this. It's not clear how to make it a tool that's easy to apply. But I mean, this is my, my first stab at actually turning this into something that one can apply. Um, it gets very, very specific, but it says, Suppose I'm in essentially the picture on the previous slide, but a little bit more general. Namely, I have a path-like structure. I have a block in somewhere in there, and I have sort of a right side and a left side. Actually, I have two different right sides and two different left sides. But suppose I'm in some picture like this, and part of the left side em embeds into part of the right side. Then, <laughs> then there's some other right side over here. Uh, this left side embeds into that right side, then this right side over here can be, and now comes the technical term, detachable. This actually has a definition. 
But then comes a lemma that if it's detachable, you can detach it. <laughs> <laughs> and this I don't want to get into right now. Okay. <laughs> but. <laughs> Well, the first one was already heavily using, and the first pruning already used a lot of induction just to set things up. Right. And then this finishes it. I will, the previous slide, whoop, that's not what I, okay. So the previous slide now tells me that I can actually erase this part, get something shorter, apply induction, and now we're actually done. Yes, we, now we're done. With very little work on our part. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, speaking of not doing work, um, there's a more fundamental way in which we're not doing work here. What's the point of doing this work? <laughs> well, we're not using the Fresset theory. And um, one of the important things I wanted to do this week was speak at this homogeneity workshop and point out the virtues of not using the Fresset theory. <laughs> um, but that has more to do with the positive side. But this is negative results. You wouldn't use the Fresset theory here anyway. But on the positive side, you'd, you'd expect to start using the Fresset theory. And we don't because I was just reminded that's another thing which is too hard that we don't do because it's too hard. Okay. And you know we're trying not to do the rigidity. There must be a rigidity construction here. There's always a rigidity construction, but that's too hard, so we do induction. So anyway, I am about to talk about positive methods. So I, now I'd like to, you know, this may be for some people the most interesting thing. How do you get these universal structures? And most of what I think about this is conjectural because, I mean, we know how to do it in, a, in principle, only in principle, but the actual results are mostly conjectural. I've been kind of focusing lately on the exclusionary part. I'm trying to build a... I don't want to use the term enemies list. I seem to have Nixon on my mind. I want, I'm building a friends list or a candidates list. I'm building a, a list of things where I think there's a universal graph because I haven't gotten rid of them. And I mean, that's my only reason. <laughs> but uh, let me talk about positive methods. So, well, we, we've been talking a lot about algebraic closure around here and for good reason. Um, Here's a notion of algebraic closure. <laughs> when I started writing these slides, I was planning on staying graph theoretic and combinatorial. And then I gave up. And this has happened to me several times. There's a point in these definitions where I really can't for the life of me seem to be a, write them down correctly without taking advantage of a little bit of model theory just to set, set the scene. But in any case, I started by giving just a straight out definition of what I mean by algebraically closed. And I guess I'm happiest with this definition actually if A is finite. But uh, now I guess this is OK. Anyway, this is the definition. Now, this strange notation, which I'm not that fond of, I just threw it in there. This is supposed to be the free amalgam, the free, free amalgam just as graphs of infinitely many copies of your ambient graph gamma over the base set A. So algebraically closed means basically that if you see something in gamma, then you can, then you could just as well have infinitely many copies of the same thing, and you'd still be C-free. So it, for those who know the model theoretic notion of algebraic closure, it feels like algebraic closure. Namely, you can repeat what you see as many times as you want, and it won't create a copy of the constraint graph. So this is a notion of algebraic closure. And it's enough to state a theorem. I don't think it's enough to actually prove the theorem, but it's enough to state the theorem. Uh, these conditions are equivalent. Uh, you have this oligomorphic universal object, or the algebraic closure of a finite set is finite. That is to say, every finite set is contained, every finite subset of every C free graph is contained in an algebraically closed finite subset. I'm not sure that's really the best way to say this. It's probably better to say it just model theoretically, but this is a way of saying it. It would sound very similar no matter how I said it. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is another one of these things that, I mean, it's closely related to what I mentioned earlier. This is one of these things that really shouldn't be true, but it is. 
I mean, you know, the, the second condition seems extremely weak and it's strong enough in this context. So, so this is my criterion here and the thing is it's actually not so easy to check in practice. And it would be even harder to get the language for amalgamation. To get the language for amalgamation, you would first of all have to check this condition, and then secondly, work out the type structure over arbitrary finite algebraically closed sets. <laughs> well, in theory, I know what the type structure is. I mean, in principle, when you have a finite algebraically closed set, its type is simply described by which fragments of the constraint set you can embed over it. Uh, that's it. That's fine for model theory, but if you're doing Ramsey theory, then you're going to need a lot more information than that. I mean, okay. Anyway, I wanted to. What we what we actually do is uh, when we're applying this method is compute the. Sorry, I was going to say compute the algebraic closure, which is kind of nonsense, except in a few cases. We estimate the size of the algebraic closure. And in order to do that, there is a computational aspect. We identify, we describe the algebraic closure rather explicitly and then try to estimate the size. It feels like a computation, but it's at the end it's just an estimation. So here's some terminology for actually deciding whether something's algebraically closed or not. So now we, so now we get into the gritty details here. And... Uh, <laughs> Never done this in public before. <laughs> Always wanted to, but <laughs> never found the right victims. And here we are. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, well, there's a lot of, there's a kind of an ambient universe you're in. And this is where I threw in the sponge and said, I'm not going to try to say this in a completely model theory free context. I mean, put yourself in an, in a nice, existentially closed model of the theory to begin with. This is long enough as it stands. And then just work inside some universal domain with a structure X, which may or may not be algebraically closed, and, um, and some interesting data about it. So anyway, these are finite sets, X, A, B. So B is free over A. If you can repeatedly copy as many copies of this as you want, uh, for all n, and A is a base. This sounds familiar. Sounds like kind of like the definition of algebraic closed in a way. A is a base for B over X if A is minimal so that B is free over it. Well, A is minimal so that first of all X is contained in A and B is free over it. So this is a reasonable. And um, so here's an example of, uh, of the word. So, Let's take, this is Kamyat's bow tie, a, a triangle attached to a triangle. Let's take a single triangle and a point in the triangle and ask what a base for the triangle over the point might actually be. Well, uh, so the base can't be the point because if you have a triangle, oh, okay, I can see that. Uh, hmm? I can't hear a thing. Anyway. I'll, I'll listen to you later. <laughs> Do we have uh, ah, no, here it is. Okay, yeah, real chalk. Plenty of real chalk. I didn't see that. Yeah. So obviously, this triangle, so this is, this is Kamyat's bow tie. With, with, with the dots included, this is Kamyat's bow tie. So a triangle can't be free over a point because two copies of it would be Kamyat's bow tie. What, what was the question? Oh. <laughs> hmm? Okay. So a triangle can't be free over one point, so there has to be something more coming in. So when you see a triangle, there has to be something more to the algebraic closure, basically. Uh, so, and this is a very well-known analysis. Um, so if you have a kind of a special edge in the triangle, if you have another point A, so that that edge 
I mean, this could happen. You could have an edge containing infinitely many triangles. There wouldn't be any bow tie. But in that case, you're free over that edge, and, and that edge is a base for the triangle. Okay? And if you're not in that situation, one possibility, there's a couple of ways that could happen. If you're not in that situation, then the triangle is a base. Oh, I think someone must have been correcting this misprint. I finally reached it. For X, uh, T is a base for T over X. <laughs> now that I've reached this point, I, I understand what I was being told. <laughs> T is a base for T over X. Okay. Uh, all right. So anyway, we need to, I've given you two definitions. We need to bring them together. So the point is something like this. There's a tight connection between algebraic closure and these bases. A is algebraically closed if and only if everything is free over A, where everything is not actually everything. Um, whoops. Well, I didn't. Well, ah, all right. Laser. OK, here we go. So um, the point is, this is really a criterion. What do I need to check is free? What I need to check is free is the stuff that comes from inside my, oh, yeah, here I got carried away. I forgot I was uh, only supposed to be talking about one constraint graph. <laughs> I, I gave the general form. So let's come back. One constraint graph. So I actually only have to check things that sit inside of C. So this is funny because there isn't very much like that. It makes it seem like the algebraic closure is always finite, but it's not so. What happens is if you're not algebraically closed, then there's this very small piece you can find that explains why, and then you look again, and maybe when you look again, you find a different violation. You ha what this says is that if I iterate, the, there's a process implicit in, in line two of looking for what's wrong with A and fixing it. Look for things that aren't free, take a base, add it to A. Keep on doing that. If at some point you're done and it's finite, then you've got your finite algebraically closed set. But there's an iterative process. So I managed, the nice thing about this lemma is you don't have to talk about that. That if you're, if you want to check whether something's algebraically closed, namely you think you're already done, then you just have to look a little bit at what's going on. So, uh, so this is how things sort of actually work. And in the case of the bow tie, you can make the following computation. Now, the first proof, Comiat's proof for the bow tie was a price A construction. You've been, we've come close to understanding the algebraic closure operation at this point in this case. But the, the rough approach to, to Comiat's theorem about the bow tie is that the algebraic closure of, uh, of any finite set Y has at most, of any finite set X has at most four times as many elements. Now, actually, we know the following. When the constraint graph has complete blocks, then the algebraic closure of a set is the union of the algebraic closures of the points. So what I'm actually claiming in this lemma, which I didn't feel like putting it all on the slide, is that the algebraic closure of one point has at most four points in it. And now you can imagine you just sit down and look. <laughs> So, what else do we want to do today? Well, uh, so for the general bouquet analysis, the main thing is to prove existence in most cases when one of the blocks, the bouquet is two blocks, two complete blocks. So, the existence problem is given a block of size at most five and another block of almost any size except maybe five, prove the existence of a universal object. And we use this criterion, namely, in order for this not to be true, there have to be many, many configurations containing pieces of my constraint graph. And these actually have to be, in this particular case, blocks of my constraint graph. So I have a graph which is sort of full of large cliques. And these large cliques take you from one point to the next point to the next point to the next point. So you have like tons and tons. It looks a lot like that picture I showed you of the overlapping K5s. There's a K5 next to a lot of other K5s, next to a lot of other K5s. 
Anyway, the delta system lemma tells you that there has to be some coherent way that in large all of these configurations meet each other. Very likely they're eventually pairwise disjoint. And using that, you can, sh you can sort of show that if you're looking at a case where you think there's a universal graph, the only actual problem that arises is precisely with m equals n equals 5, where by the time you finish the analysis, you're looking at the picture that tells you what's wrong. Which is locally the things meet, but very soon after that they become disjoint. Which is not very easy to arrange without putting the constraint graph in, in most cases. So this is, you know, this is that. So anyway, uh, I thought I'd write down some very explicit conjecture. So. Uh, I mean, on one hand, the, the trees become paths, and the one block becomes complete. And so this is, um, I, I decided to focus here on the case, what happens if you are looking at a block path, and it has, well, it has complete blocks. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is the conjecture, sorry. So C contains no trivial blocks. This is the main thing. So. By trivial block, I mean an edge, which is you know, sort of isolated in the graph. So a tree consists entirely of trivial blocks. So this is, I'm trying to say here, suppose this is the opposite of a tree. Suppose this is the opposite of a tree, then what could it be look like? And, and so the conjecture is that, first of all, it should be a block path in that case, literally. And it should be on this list. So this is. I don't, you know, this is not a conjecture in any old-fashioned sense of the word, like I believe that this is completely correct or something, but <laughs> uh, this is sort of what I believe at the moment, today, you know. And uh, in particular, I haven't, in, in almost all cases, I have no proof at all of existence and no attempt at a proof, okay? These are the ones that I don't think I can eliminate. And the others that you don't see are the ones that I do think that I have eliminated, but <laughs> OK. <laughs> so all right. So anyway, this is, so I'm not getting the simplest possible answer here. Um, if you. No, no. 3 to the L minus 1 n, so this is a string of 3s, L minus 1 3s, and then an n. So, sorry, what's the notation here? Uh, many, many, it's kind of it's getting, getting a little. No, no, no commas. No, 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 sorry. This is a very compressed slide. Let me explain what I'm saying. Let me explain what I'm saying. Is that a good idea? No, 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 no. It, it may be beyond the clock, but uh, <laughs> C is a block path with complete uh, blocks. So these blocks have certain sizes, and these sizes will be written as a string from N1 up through NL. Now, for reasons of space, the first line consists of three possibilities. Oh. I, maybe I should have used semicolons instead of commas. I'm sorry, but anyway. The first possibility is L minus 1, 3s, and an N. Now, let, me, let me tell you how to read this. First of all, imagine a, imagine a long chain of triangles. And imagine that what this slide says is, it has to be a long chain of triangles unless it's not. <laughs> so it could be a long chain of triangles and then God knows what. Or a long chain of triangles and then God knows what and then something else and then another triangle. <laughs> or maybe two fours. <laughs> And then some other things that are all of bounded length where you get to play with a couple more parameters. But there's some odd things going on down here, for example, in length, well, all through length three through five. But in length three, for example, you can have two big blocks at the end, but you need something small in between just to soften the blow. <laughs> so <laughs> no, 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 no. Underneath two, well, one, I suppose. I don't know. I think I forgot. I think I may have forgotten about one. <laughs> and so there we go. Anyway, it's sort of, do I get to say this? Um, a few remarks. Um, you know, I, I was very sort of detailed and sort of into it. But uh, 
I went to the anti opposite of tree case because I really don't understand the full case very well. In, in the mixed case, by which I mean you have some trivial blocks as well, then there should be, among other things, this old problem that I find very interesting, a complete graph with one path of any length attached at every vertex. I think there's a universal object in general, but this seems hard to prove. And I, I kind of look at the pictures and I look and I say to myself, Menger's theorem, and nothing happens. So, <laughs> so I think it's an interesting question for some graph theorist who wants to take the trouble to understand what the question actually is. Uh, but it's a very broad class that for, for which existence of the universal object is very definitely not proved, and we sort of know what the issues are. As I mentioned, if you forbid induced graphs, then this stuff is unmanageable. An old tiling problem is coded. If you generalize the substructures, there's a coding essentially in the language of graphs. We didn't quite get it in the language of graphs. We needed also to have a, some unary predicates, two colors of vertices. <laughs> It's not quite in the language of graphs. So the general problem seems to be very similar to the, the graph case. And the last one, I really don't know what happens with permutation patterns, but I think it's a very interesting question. Permutation pattern classes with forbidden constraints. They ask zillions of sort of algorithmic questions, very similar to the ones that I ask. And there is a literature where they sort of grope towards some universal object for the class, but I think they have the wrong definitions. Um, I mean, I don't think they have a general definition, and we certainly do. But the theory that I've described doesn't apply in that case, because I'm really using free amalgamation. And I think there ought to be a theory that's relevant to that case as well, but someone should develop it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.